In this video, we're going to do a quick overview of the model of the atom. We're going to take a look at the history behind how the model of the atom was developed, looking at some early ideas of the atom uh, all the way to the uh, quantum mechanical model of the atom. So we'll start off with the early models and then uh, make our way through the progression of the model with uh, evidence of research. So uh, this is the main timeline we'll be looking at. We'll be taking a look at uh, John Dalton all the way to Schrodinger's model, as well as some uh, earlier ideas um, from Aristotle, for example, and Democritus. So uh, this will be the first emphasis of our presentation, this first little chunk of, of the atomic model. And then the next presentation, we'll take a look at the uh, last two models over here. So some early ideas of uh, the atom uh, came 300 BC from Democritus and other philosophers. These weren't based in science. That was their limitation. There was no scientific evidence for it. It was just more ideas. And the model behind this, the idea behind this model is that if you take a substance and you cut it into smaller and smaller pieces and you keep cutting it and keep cutting it, you'll get to a point where you can't divide it anymore. And that point uh, is what uh, Democritus proposed to be called atomos or indivisible, the atom. And so atoms were described as small hard particles that were made of the same material, but were formed into different shapes and sizes. So different types of atoms that have different shapes and sizes. Again, this wasn't based on scientific evidence. Um, it was just sort of a, a, a philosophical thought um, without any observations or anything to support it, which again is a limitation. So another early idea is from Aristotle. Uh, this was accepted from about 300 BC to, to the 1800s. We call this the death of chemistry. There were no... Um, new notable ideas that were on record at, at least um, for chemistry at the time. Uh, so uh, Aristotle was also a philosopher um, and this was not based on scientific evidence. The idea here was that matter is made up of only four elements, fire, air, water, uh, water and earth. Um, and then all matter has just four properties. So you could have hot, cold, cold over here, wet and dry. Um, so this again had several limitations first of all there's no scientific evidence to back this up we know there's way more than four elements out there there's over 100 elements and and we know that atoms are actually divisible uh you can divide them into smaller and smaller parts so philosophers at the time didn't realize that they thought that you couldn't uh divide uh the atom up into anything smaller um but as we know today uh you can so these were again were not based on science um and really we didn't hear much more about these thoughts uh, until the 1800s when we get to John Dalton. So John, Don John Dalton comes up with a model called the billiard ball model. And this is a description of his model here. So matter is composed of indestructible, indivisible atoms, which are identical for one element, but different from other elements. So Dalton basically visualized atoms as these small, hard spheres. Uh, so some elements would be um, red spheres, uh, some elements would be blue spheres, some would be green spheres, some would have different sizes, um, different features depending on what element you're dealing with. But the idea is that the atom is a solid, indivisible sphere. So you can't divide it into anything. This is the smallest you can get. Okay. Um, but one of the main limitations of this is that further experiments started to show that, you know what? The atom is not an indivisible sphere. There's probably smaller parts to it. And you know those smaller parts today are the protons, electrons, and neutrons. But that was the main problem with Dalton's model is that it didn't uh, it didn't hold up to those experiments that showed that the atom is made up of smaller parts. So this was in about 1805. Um, the good thing with Dalton's model is that it was, uh, it was actually able to explain and was supported by several um, chemical laws. So the law of definite composition, multiple proportions, and conservation of mass um, supported Dalton's model and was able to, um, and Dalton's model was able to explain those. So this was Dalton's atomic theory over here, uh, these three main points. So each chemical element is made up of these indestructible atoms that are spheres. Uh, and this was the sort of the periodic table um, that Dalton would, would come up with. So element one would have spheres that look like this, element two like this, um, the other neat thing is that uh, you could actually connect uh, the different elements together to make um, compounds. So you could connect them in different ratios um, to make uh, different substances called compounds. Um, and then the other thing that, again, Dalton uh, stated is that all elements, um, all, all spheres of the same element would, would look alike, but all, all spheres of different elements would be different. So all element one would look like this. 
all element two would look like this and all element three would look like this. So these are the main points of Dalton's atomic theory. Um, and this was Dalton's inspiration for the model. He used to play a game called lawn bowling and he pictured atoms kind of like this. They have their uh, indestructible spheres. Um, you might have areas where you can connect them together uh, to make compounds, but that was his inspiration. So scientists, when they come up with models, they'll often have some inspiration after which they'll name a model. Uh, for me, I know that I would be naming them after uh, Timbits. Uh, so each each atom would be sort of a different Timbit. Um, uh, each atom of an element would be a different Timbit or flavored Timbit. So again, uh, you don't have to know all these, these laws right now, um, but Dalton's model was able to explain a lot of the laws at the time. So the law of definite proportion. Um, so if you look here, we have water from two different uh, samples here, uh, and it's made up of 12% hydrogen oxygen by mass. And Dalton could basically say, well, I know why that is because you know the oxygen has this mass and the hydrogen has another a different mass. Uh, and they combine in these ratios here, one oxygen for two hydrogens. And that explains the the, the mass ratio of hydrogen to oxygen in, in samples of water. Um, and for the law of multiple proportion, well, you can see here that we have um, several compounds made of the same elements, but connected um, in different proportions. So we have one N to one O, one N to two O's, two N's to one O, two N to two O's, two N's to five O's. And so Dalton can once again explain the idea that if you have nitrogen monoxide, it's always going to exist in a 1 to 1.143 ratio. Uh, and nitrogen dioxide will always exist in a 1 to 2.286 ratio. Uh, because again, uh, these spheres having their, their own sort of individual mass, oxygen has this math, hydrogen has this mass, and they connect in those proportions in those ratios uh, by mass. Um, now, the uh, law of conservation of mass, uh, Dalton could also explain it. And just, just generally here, you can see that when you do a chemical reaction, if you have you know, five grams of stuff, you have to end up with five grams of stuff at the end as well. And Dalton could easily explain that because what he's basically saying is that you have these small hard spheres that are reacting together and they're not destroyed. Um, they just connect together in those different ways as we saw in the previous slides. And so you're not losing any of the spheres. So in the end, they should weigh the same anyways. Um, so they're just rearranged during a reaction, they're not destroyed, and that's what can explain the law of conservation of mass. So again, Dalton's model was pretty powerful because it could explain the, the main laws of chemistry, uh, but the main problem here is that Dalton's model is not really accurate and didn't hold up to future experiments, which showed that uh, the atom is actually made up of smaller parts after all. So let's go take a look at one of those uh, future experiments that uh, broke down uh, Dalton's model of the atom. We'll talk about J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson came up with a model called the plum pudding model. J.J. Uh, Thompson essentially said that the atom is not an indestructible sphere. Instead, there's actually different uh, a particle in there, a negative particle. Um, and that's what we know as the electron today. So the negative particles in there are embedded in a positive bun or positive sphere. Uh, which means that the atom is made up of smaller parts essentially. So we have our positive sphere over here with little negative particles or electrons embedded within. So how did the Thompson come up with this plum pudding model? Uh, let's so take a look at his experiment and then afterwards we'll see why he called it a plum pudding model. So Thompson used something called a cathode ray tube. This is a cathode ray tube over here. And uh, you can see this beam of negative of, of particles over here. So this is a beam of particles going through a uh, cathode ray tube and they're much smaller than the atom. Um, and so what he did is he essentially brought a magnet close to the beam of particles and you'll see that the beam of particles was deflected. And that would indicate that these particles here had a negative charge based on the way they interacted with the magnetic field. So what that means is that there were particles smaller than the atom that were negative. So the atom is made up, has some negative particles in there, um, which means that the atom is not indivisible like Dalton thought after all. Now, the other thing Thompson said is, well, I know atoms are neutral overall. So if there's negative particles, there has to be something positive there to make it neutral. Um, and so that's where he said, well, the positive is the bun. And then I'll just stick all the uh, negative particles in the bun, almost like raisin bread. Let's go take a look at a few other pictures. So this would be a model over here. We have the, the bun, the doughy part itself would be the positive stuff. And then all the raisins would be the negative or a chocolate chip muffin. The bun, the doughy stuff here would be the positive, and then you embed the electrons in there, um, 
the negative charges. Okay? And he called it the plum pudding model because that was a dessert that he was familiar with at the time. Uh, so you have this doughy part and then raisins embedded in there, and that's Thompson's model. Um, now this one here, I don't expect you to know all the details of this experiment. This was just how to find uh, the the uh, the charge of an electron and the mass of an electron. Um, so uh, you can go over it. It's called the Millikan oil drop experiment. It's a really uh, intricate experiment. If you are a physics fan, um, you want you'd be able to see the ca the connection between chemistry and physics with a bunch of forces being applied. I included a video here that you can watch, so you can go over it if you'd like more details on it. So Thompson's model wasn't necessarily correct either. When you have a model, scientists will test it. And that's that's part of the, that's what science is about. We take your model and we test it to see if it can support and explain things. Um, or we sometimes find out that your model is not the best and we need to modify it. And that's what happens with the model of the atom. So another scientist named Ernest Rutherford decided to do an experiment called the gold foil experiment. So let's go to the next slide for a second to see what the gold foil experiment uh, looked like and then what or how it led to this as a new model rather than this this plum pudding model over here from Thomson. Uh, so you can see over here that Ernest Rutherford was testing out uh, Thomson's model. He took a sheet of gold foil and shot these positive particles at the gold foil. It was a very thin sheet of gold foil made up of gold atoms and then he shot alpha particles towards the gold foil. And so if Thomson is right about the plum pudding model, those alpha particles should go through the gold foil without deflecting too much. It should all mostly go through just like this. This is what we should expect to see. All of them go straight through because you have an even charge distribution of the bun and the electrons are embedded within. So they should all go straight through. Now that's not what happened. This is what Ernest Rutherford actually saw. Some of them did go straight through, but there were also some that deflected at larger angles than expected. Like these were huge deviations from what we'd expect. So alpha particles are positive, right? They're being repelled or deflected by something. That means whatever they're being reflected by or repelled by or deflected by probably has a positive charge. So here's what was happening. If you kind of zoom in and, and picture this. So this is the gold foil sheet over here. Most of the atom is, is empty space at this point because most of the particles are flying through no problem, but there are a few that are being deflected. So what, what, Rutherford was saying is that most of the atoms empty space that explains why most things are flying through most alpha particles are going through, but there must be some little region in the atom that the alpha particle is bouncing and hitting into to bounce off of and then being deflected. And so that little region is the positive charge. And that's what becomes known as the nucleus, the positive nucleus or the protons essentially at this point. So rather than the positive bun being the positive charge, Rutherford said, you know what? The atom is mostly empty space. The positive charge is going to be in the middle, a very dense region of positive charge in the middle that the particles are hitting, and that's why they're bouncing off of. And we'll call that the nucleus. There's only positive particles in there, protons, essentially. Um, and then the electrons are orbiting around them, orbiting around the, uh, the nucleus. So this becomes the nuclear model. Some sources sometimes call it the planetary model, but that's more related to Bohr. Um, but this is a nuclear model that Ernest Rutherford comes up with. Uh, and that was because of the evidence that was obtained from the gold foil experiment. And there's a video you can watch over here to get more of a visual of the gold foil experiment. Now, this model is not perfect either. There's a bunch of limitations with it. Uh, firstly, uh, a nucleus being made of only positive particles of only protons would probably not be very stable because if things have the same charge, they'll repel. So there's got to be something else in there, some other particle in there that is maybe holding things together. Um, and also when they do mass experiments, they often see that when they estimate mass of atoms, um, they're, they're usually not right. They're, they usually estimate them as being too low or sometimes they're, they're just different masses altogether. So there's something missing. There's some other particle that must be contributing some mass that we don't know about yet. And as you're probably kind of thinking right now, oh, well, there's one more particle we haven't talked about yet. That's the neutron. So it's probably the neutron. So we'll see about how that was solved. Um, and then there's one more main problem that we'll see in just a minute. So this again is our gold foil experiment, just highlighting um, what, what should have happened, uh, but this is what actually happened uh, 
so th this this is highlighting what happened. Um, you can see here the alpha particles hit the nucleus, and that's why some of them deflect, but most of them go through um, the gold sheet because the atom is mostly empty space. Um, whenever they do deflect, that's because of the alpha particles hitting the nucleus. So uh, let's go and solve the problem of, of the uh, the nucleus being only positive charges. This is James Chadwick over here. Um, this is his experiment, how he discovered the neutron. Um, so basically he shot these alpha particles towards a sheet of beryllium and that knocked out some, some big particles. Um, now, how do you know they were big particles? Well, um, he had them collide into paraffin wax and that knocked out protons. So basically if you can move protons, um, then you're a pretty big particle. And how did he know it was roughly, they were roughly the same size as protons? Well, let's say there were four neutrons here, they knocked out four protons. So they rough, they knock out roughly the same amount of protons, which means they're roughly the same mass. Um, so the other thing you notice too is that these particles didn't have a charge. So these were neutral overall. So that means that in the atom, there's not just electrons and protons, but there's also these other big particles in the nucleus called neutrons. And that helps to keep the nucleus um, stable, holding the uh, positive charges together. It also helps to explain isotopes, why there are some atoms um, of the same element that have different masses. Um, they should have the same number of protons. So what's changing is the different number of neutrons um, that's changing as well. So this was essentially added to Ernest Rutherford's model. So we have our dense nucleus with a positive charge, uh, protons in there. And then we also have our neutrons, thanks to James Chadwick, and then our electrons orbiting, and then the atom is mostly empty space. So there's still a problem though. So we have our electrons orbiting, we have our nucleus with our neutrons. One main problem that still remains with this model is that these electrons are orbiting the nucleus, and as they're doing that, they should, they're, they're, they should be losing energy continuously, so nonstop loss of energy. And as a result, they should eventually just spiral into the nucleus and pff, obliterate the atom. Uh, the atom should be destroyed, but it's not happening, right? If that was happening, you wouldn't be here, your pencil wouldn't be here, your laptop wouldn't be here. So why isn't the electron colliding into the nucleus as it's losing the energy continuously? That's our main problem currently. So we need to see um, how that eventually will be solved. Essentially in this presentation, what we did is we viewed the uh, early ideas from philosophers like Democritus and Aristotle, we saw um, Dalton's model, how that was modified to become Thomson's model eventually with the uh, cathode ray tube experiment, and then how eventually the gold foil experiment of Rutherford led to uh, nuclear, the nuclear model from Ernest Rutherford. And of course, we had Chadwick contributing the idea of the neutron in there as well. Um, but there's still a problem with this model. So eventually, we need to modify it, and we'll get to Bohr's model. And so in the next presentation for this lesson, we're going to take a look at how we went from Rutherford's model to Bohr's model using some amazing new ideas from physics.